Welcome to Kim Talks Resilience, where we share stories of insight and inspiration in life, love, and business with resilient women from around the world. Speaking with authors, entrepreneurs, founders, and coaches to learn their strategies for a more resilient life so we can all build the life we love. I'm your host, Kim Hayden. All righty, welcome back to the show. If it's your first time joining us, you know what? I promise you this, you're going to leave the show inspired. And that's that's what we're here for. We I I love the opportunity to uh, speak with women that in many ways have come through these significant challenges, share their strategies of moving forward, and then we're they are going from there and how we can either engage or support or so, you know, anything along those lines. Um, one of the things that almost every American knows, and if you don't know, I don't know what rock you've been living under, but um, the United States has one of the highest incarceration rates globally. And you, if you're ever faced with this, or you know, somebody who's faced with this, it literally can, can impact your freedom and your rights for the rest of your life, no matter if you're right, rightfully or wrongfully like incarcerated, no matter what it is, the reality is this can, you know, lead to so many significant issues moving forward in the sense of we have, there's a high rate of, you know, reoffense in the United States. And, and, you know, how do you move forward? Well, our guest today, uh, Cheryl Armstrong, I'm super excited because she has literally come through and reinvented where so many never can find that path. Cheryl is the founder and owner of plant your energy with over 15 years of experience, helping currently and formerly incarcerated individuals to change their thinking and transform their character during the 26 years. 26 years of incarceration, Cheryl earned an MA in humanities, launched Plant Your Energy, and wrote her first book, Plant Your Energy, Face Your Demons and Transform Your Life. She published her book shortly after her release in 2021 and created a class from it, which she is now teaching to Colorado prisons. Her goal is to expand the pr- the program in prisons across the country, helping people to create lasting change in their lives. Cheryl believes that no one is their worst mistake. She currently lives in Arizona and is working to build Plant Your Energy so she can play a part in changing people's lives for the better. Uh, I'm super excited to go into this because I think every American, including myself, will know somebody who has been incarcerated, is incarcerated, or is in in a vulnerable place. And, you know, those those bars aren't just, they, they, they go, they're not only just physical, right? They go all the way across into the emotional and the, the metaphorical space of, of opportunity. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. Thank you. <laughs> I am. I'm absolutely super excited that you're here um, because I, you know, I have, a, I have family members who I have one that's in, in a life sentence. Um, my God, mom's son uh, ended up out in Colorado in mm. a federal penitentiary. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and these things happen. These things happen. I mean, my God, mom's son was a youth, a young man who his wife had got caught up with the wrong people and he couldn't, Mm -hmm. he couldn't, he did couldn't jeopardize his, his family. So he just took the hit. Right. And these things are very real. These things are very real. Um, So I would love for you to share a bit more of who is Cheryl because I believe that these stories are the reasons we all need to sit up and listen. Right. So, you know, the driving force behind everything that I have created since well before I got out of prison 
is to show the world just that, like who I am, because I didn't want to be known just for the biggest mistake of my life, right? So my crime, which I, I can get in, uh, more into that when I share more of my story, uh, but I, I was just 16 years old when this happened. And I was wild and out of control and uh, had no consideration for my own safety, let alone the safety, safety of the, the people around me. And I, uh, I was very reckless with my actions and it cost me dearly as well as many other people, everyone involved in the situation. But, you know, who I am is so different from what I did. And so that, like I said, has been why I created my business, wrote my book, and, and why I'm living my life the way that I do, because I am a much more positive person now than I used to be. I'm motivated. I'm disciplined. I'm f filled with gratitude. Uh, and after serving that much time in prison, you really learn how to appreciate all the little things in life. And so I've had a number of tragedies, even in the last year and a half, I've lost three people uh, passed away that were the closest to me in my life. And so I feel like, wow, you know, I'm trying to adjust to life out here in the real world. And I keep getting hit with these tragedies. And so uh, I've been out for two and a half years now, and I'm still figuring things out. And as far as being a business owner and an author and an aspiring speaker, because that is my ultimate dream is to become a public speaker. And uh, I want to give a TED talk. So as I try to pursue all these things, you know, I have to juggle, you know, making a living and dealing with losing my stepdad and my mom. And most recently, uh, five weeks ago, my boyfriend. And so I feel like my world keeps getting rocked by these things I can't control. And if it hadn't been for all of the work I had put in while I was inside, uh, I don't think I would be handling my life as well as I am right now. And so I've kind of become a poster child for resilience. Uh, uh, one thing, a little fun fact about me is I absolutely love dogs. I trained dogs for about six years uh, of my incarceration. And uh, two of the three dogs that I own, I actually got to train myself while I was in prison. So I got to hand select them. So yeah, that's a passion of mine. Amazing. And you were in prison during some really important years in a woman's life, right? So these are the years that we could get married and have children and all of that, all of those choices were taken away from you. Um, yeah. And that's, 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 so the dogs then become those, that surrogate, that space, that you, that unconditional love. Yeah. Those are my babies. <laughs> those are your babies. And you have every right to have fur babies. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you, if you could walk me through, uh, plant your energy, I'd like to know, because this has got to be a really challenging space to be in. Cause in the United States, our penal system and our judicial system is so polarized. It is so polarized. It's like, you've got people out there who I swear, sir, are some people out there that if they could like, press a button and just implode every prison and just get rid of all the bad people. Right. Cause they have no tolerance. Right. right? Yeah. Um, and that, that affects people because I know that the individuals I know that have gone to prison, it has been because there were decisions made, but it's not the sum of who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so walk me through plant, your energy. I'd like to understand what you're doing in these spaces, especially because they may not be the most forgiving of spaces. Right. So, you know, I was in prison for a violent crime. And so there is always going to be um, judgment from some people, right? Because they don't know me. They look at what happened and that's all they see. And so I had to come to terms with that. And I had to build the strength within myself to say, you know what, those people can, they're, everyone is entitled to their opinion, but I can't let other people's opinion define my opinion of myself, right? And so uh, it took a, many years of building my self-esteem too, because I had a lot of guilt and shame connected to my crime and my actions 
uh, the remorse that I felt for what I did, it just seemed to even deepen year after year as I got older, as my brain matured, because I, I, you know, essentially finished growing up in prison. And so the, you know, as I got into my mid 20s, I just, I, I tried to wrap my mind around like, how was I a part of something that took the lives of two people. Uh, and to give a little context, I, I drove the getaway car in a double homicide. Uh, so what I had to do was come to terms with my role in my crime. And to walk you through the birth of Plancher Energy, uh, that is my business. I started the LLC while I was still incarcerated with the help of my wonderful, amazingly supportive mom who passed away a little over a year ago. Um, she helped me get a website set up. She helped me bring my idea to life. And uh, at the time that I started the business, hadn't even thought about writing a book yet. I actually started the business with a clothing line, which is extremely small. Uh, basically, I designed four different designs. We threw them on some t-shirts. Uh, I, I, there's not really much to it, but I, I always tell people and it's on my website, you have to start to finish. And so I just was so filled with passion to create something positive out of what I had been through. That was how I thought about plant your energy. And so basically what it means is, you know, planting your energy is, is a mindset and I am trying to teach people to become uh, very aware that every thought that they're thinking, every action that they're taking has a ripple effect in their life as well as the lives of the people around them. And so I think that, you know, we get so used to just doing what we do every day that, that we're not even aware really of who we really are and who we really would like to be if we were the best version of ourselves. And I think that a lot of people end up settling in their lives because they have to get a job just to make ends meet and they just do what they do every day. And so I didn't want to be that person, right? When I finally had my chance to walk out of prison, I wanted to live my best life. And I also knew, like, like you mentioned, there's a lot of judgment, a lot of barriers that come with being incarcerated. And I didn't want to be bound by those. And so my way of working through that and, and currently trying to surpass that is start my own business and do my own thing. And why not use my life experience and the life lessons, the hard life lessons I have learned to try to help other people do the same with their lives. And so after I launched the LLC, it was probably a year or two uh, when I thought, of the idea to write this book. And I initially was going to have my first book be my life story because I'm told I have a intriguing, compelling, powerful story of transformation. So I thought, well, maybe there's something to that and I should write about my story, which I do plan to still do that down the line. But the first book ended up being more about how I transformed my character. And so it, has turned into a character development life skills class, basically. Uh, I wrote a workbook that accompanies the book, and uh, I've been teaching it in the prisons in Colorado, trying to help people figure out how they face whatever their demons are within themselves, uh, to take responsibility for their life and try to manifest a much better life for themselves moving forward. Amazing. Um, I look at my kids. So just so you know, I have a 22 year old that still that moved back in. Um, mm -hmm. So I, a lot of my kids moved back in during the pandemic. And you know what, I love having them here. Uh, I have a 33 year old son and a 25 year old son. Okay. And I know that my 33 year old made some questionable choices. And it's only by luck that he didn't end up in some significant trouble. Right. Um, my 25 year or 25 year old who is, uh, like almost like he's brilliant, but we had real struggles when he was a child and had to go through lots of counseling. He had lots of things stacked against him. And the doctor said, when they gave us his diagnosis, they said, by the way, 80% of men in prison have this exact same diagnosis. 
Wow. So in going back to your younger self and understanding all of your studies and what you teach now, mm -hmm. what are some of the things we could do to help circumvent, help change that trajectory for our 14 year olds and our 15 year olds and our 16 year olds and our 17 year olds. What are some of the things that, what are some of the, 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 the flags that, you know, we could have seen, because I guarantee your mom is a great person. Your dad is a great person. These are, these are not bad people. No, raising, not at all. it's, it's that, that something was maybe missed or something mm -hmm. that, that, you know, they say you are the sum of your five friends. Right. 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 Uh, you know, honestly, I don't think that there's any right answer for that because I think that there's so many different variables depending upon your environment, the people you have around you, how you were raised, right? So it's going to look a little different for everybody, but I analyzed that for myself for many okay. years. And it was really hard because like you just said, like I was educated. I had a really great family. I, I didn't suffer any physical or sexual abuse as a child. I didn't have those types of traumas. Right. So it's like, well, why did I end up the way that I ended up? And so, I mean, it was simple things like my parents owned a mailboxes, et cetera, store when I was a teenager. And so they were consumed by the business and I was at home by myself all the time. And so I, I finally figured out that that was a big factor, right? I had so much time on my hands. I was bored and I had grown up in small towns and was exposed to the city for the first time when they owned this store. And so I kind of recognized like with my boredom, and also we moved around a lot. And so when we moved to the suburbs of Denver, uh, I kind of fell in with the first people that I met, right? And so those people were not making good choices. They were smoking pot, they were ditching school. I had never done any of those things. I started doing all of that because you you can be so easily influenced, right? And I wanted that acceptance and I wanted a group of people that I fit in with. And so I kind of just fell into that. And I was having a good time. And so then I embraced that, right? And so I also think that, uh, and I don't like, I'm real careful about how I say these things because I'm a big believer that you need to take responsibility for your choices in your life. Yes, I agree. No matter what has been done to you by other people or how you've been influenced, we still have that capability to make our own choices, right? Yeah. But I do think, obviously, you're you're uh, more easily influenced when you're younger. And so I had three older brothers and four stepbrothers, and I had a lot of violence modeled to me. Um, never aggression. In the home, never in the home. It was aggression, and it was that whole, you know, uh, excuse my language, but I, I'm a badass, and yeah. I'm going to intimidate you. I have that, you know, the fear thing going on, and. I ended up um, equating fear with respect because I saw it modeled in my brothers and I thought that it was so, I thought it was cool, really, you know, because nobody would mess with them and it was like, oh, I want to be that person. And so I tried to model that in my own way, but as a female, I wasn't as violent, but I just kind of developed this um, attitude and this whole vibe where uh, I wanted to be intimidating. And then I, I, all this anger came from God knows where, right? Like, honestly, I have never found any solid answer to some of those questions still today, but I decided that I don't necessarily need to, because instead of always looking backwards, I wanted to start looking forwards and I, I just wanted to be a better person. And so I'm like, all right, well, let me put my thoughts and my energy into figuring out how I can turn these character traits around. Right. So yeah. that's what I did. Well, obviously you had very strong character traits in the sense that, yeah. So that's, and that is probably what is carrying you forward now as you're working in your, in your new career. Yeah. For I, sure. I would, I would say as a mother, one of the things I heard in there was if your if your kid is getting isolated, yeah. you need to figure out a way um, I, I know that I dragged my kids to every open house with me. They worked every event. Um, they were always with me. I was a crappy, crappy educational parent. Like mm -hmm. my kids homework always sucked. 
Um, <laughs> I, there's so many things I could have done better, but the one thing I did was I kept them really close to me and they were, we were lockstep on everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was very raw and real. Cause I know in watching what happened with, you know, our, the, the extended family and, and some people within our sphere growing up, yeah. it can happen so easily. It can. Right? Yeah. So in your program, when you go into these prisons, mm -hmm. what are you saying? Like, how are you approaching? First of all, how are you getting the prisons to even engage with you? Because these are people like a lot of people are holier than thou. Right. Yeah. And, oh, I would have never done that. No, 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 no. And then, and then you're coming in as, you know, basically the prodigal child. I want to come back and, and share with you. Yeah. People think I'm I've crazy. Learned. Like, why would you want to go back in there? <laughs> I, I, I totally get it though. I totally yeah. get it. How do you get the prisons to engage with you? Because. So that's that, why, that's why I started in Colorado. So that's where I'm from. And that's where I served my sentence at was in Colorado. So um, interestingly enough, some of the top people in the Department of Corrections in the state of Colorado are people who were starting their DOC careers when I was starting my sentence. And so I've known these, these officers who have promoted, promoted, and now they're in important positions in the department. And so I thought, you know, this might be a long shot, but I'm going to, I'm going to take it because that's what I do. So I reached out and I said, Hey, I developed this class. I would really love to bring my program into the prisons there. And so they kind of launched it as a pilot program to see how it went. And to be clear, I'm still in the early stages of all of this. You know, I'm learning as I go and I'm just trying to build from what I have started. And so uh, I'm only in a couple prisons in Colorado. I am trying to get into the Arizona prisons and they seem open minded, but it is a bit challenging because a little old me is not really very significant in the grand scheme of things with what the, the Department of Corrections has going on. And there's so many programs available to them that they can put into their facilities, right? And so uh, I'm working on being the person that stands out and builds a program that is successful for the people who are in my class. And so far, I it's going really well. It's going really well. I just finished two classes about six weeks ago, and I was in Colorado briefly, um, which, uh, long story, I moved up there for a job and it didn't work out and I'm now back in Arizona. But while I was there, the, the best thing that came out of that was that I got to go into the prisons, a men's and a women's facility and teach in person. And it was an incredible experience. And I have staff members who want to continue to teach the class now. And so my hope is to just keep building it and, and start putting it into other states. Excellent. What about um, the uh, youth incarcerations? So those 16, 17 and 18 year olds, would a program like this work with yeah. one of those youth that are? I, I definitely yeah. think so. I know that when I was that age and I was making nothing but terrible choices, uh, probably the only person that could have gotten my attention would have been someone like me. So, I mean, you, you meet a person who did that much time in prison, who has been through the things that I've lived through and you listen to those people. Right. And, and that's the, the, the case for me in the adult facilities too. Like right away, there's that relatability and that mutual respect because yep. they know I've been where they are. Yeah. So we, we, all, I always ask a story of resilience, but I can quite frankly already know just coming through, that's the story of resilience. However, can we break that down? Um, when you had to face the hard facts about your choices and you had to dig deep within yourself, mm -hmm. can we go through a little bit of that of how, give us a strategy or something you did because a lot of people will not do that hard work because it hurts. And that is what my entire program is all about. And to clarify, like the, my book and my class, it's not just for people who are in prison, right? It's for people. Everybody has issues and struggles and demons that they're dealing with or not 
more likely not dealing with, right? Uh, things that have been problems in our lives. And so my strategy, the first part of it, I was about eight years into my sentence when I started making some changes and I could not stand living in my own skin anymore. I was miserable. I was angry. I had so much shame for what I had done and the person I had been in my actions. And I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I thought I have to become a different person. I can't live the rest of my life feeling like this every single day. Even if it means that the rest of my life is in prison, I want to be a better person. I want to be a person that has some peace in my heart, a person that can smile and laugh at things, you know, because for, for a while I felt like I didn't deserve that. Um, you know, so I had to work through those things. And the very first piece of that is taking responsibility for every single choice that I had made, right? And it's like, that's why I told you earlier when we talk about like, oh, well, what are the things that happened that made you who you are? Sure, we can evaluate those things. And I know that's a big part of counseling and therapy and all of that, but that's really not my, that's not my thing. I feel like sometimes we get lost in that. And so we're not really growing because we're choosing to stay stuck and figuring out things that are done with, right? And so I'm like, all right, I did this. I mean, it took me almost a decade to really be able to come out and just say, this is what I did. This is my role in my crime. I want to own what I did and how I impacted these people's lives. And it was one of the hardest things I ever did. And for years, I would cry every time I would talk about it. Uh, I just, I didn't have the strength in me, you know, and, but I have built on that since then. And, and so I've just been disciplined with, Hey, if I make a mistake, I'm going to own up to that mistake. Even if it means a relationship ends, or if it means there are some sort of consequences or repercussions for me, I want to wake up every day knowing that I'm a genuine person and that when somebody hears something come out of my mouth, that it's authentic. Right. Uh, so I talk a lot about authentic authenticity, but not just with other people. I talk about how you need to be authentic with yourself first and foremost, right? So many people try to um, throw a mask on, you know, so much so that they don't even know themselves. And I see that happen all the time. And so that's the first two chapters of my book are all about like figuring out what are my demons? What are the things within me that are keeping me trapped in recurring themes in my life? Whatever that looks like different for everybody. Okay, how can I own my part in whatever that cycle is, right? And so it's it's hard, hard work, and nobody really wants to do it, right? But you have to be able to see the big picture and what's on the other side when, when you finally have that growth. And so I try to help people get from the beginning stages to where they can see that light and, you know, a lot of the things in my book, they're not groundbreaking new concepts that no one has heard of. They are things that we all know, but I think that we forget to practice, right? So I'm talking about things like, well, how can you change your paradigms? You know, what are your triggers? But not just what are your triggers? How do you recognize when you've been triggered? And how do you make a different choice in that moment, right? Because like you said, it's so easy to fall into something that you're going to regret later. It may not be something that has anything to do with uh, the justice system. It could be, you know, your relationship with someone in your family or at work. It could be applied to anything in your life. And so I just try to help people start being more mindful about everything that they're thinking and to pause and take that moment before they react and do something yeah. That isn't taking them in the direction they really want to go, you know. I I totally get it. And I the word that you used around shame, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. And we walk around with shame and regret in so many things that that stops us from growing into our truth, exactly. right? Yes. What, what we can become. Yes. Um so uh, in your book, so you, you, where can we get the book, first of all? The book's on Amazon. The book and the workbook are both on Amazon. Excellent. Um, 
what can the reader expect from the book? So the reader, most likely, if they just go and purchase it from Amazon, is not currently in the penal system. So what could I expect from a book or somebody like me? You can expect the same thing that a person who is in prison would would expect to get out of it, right? Okay. This book applies to humans. I have started what I'm doing in the prisons, but it applies to people. I mean, I'm talking about everyday problems that we all have. We all have issues of some sort, right? We have flawed thinking in one way or another. We have choices we've made in the past that we wish we had chose differently, um, maybe we have these dreams that we want to bring to life, but we're not doing anything to pursue it. Right. And so it's for anybody that wants to be a better person that wants to pursue the life of their dreams, because I started doing that from a prison cell, which is what makes my story in some people's view, powerful, um, or different, but really it's the same for anybody that you know, oh, I wish that I was doing this. Well, why aren't you doing this? You know, how can you get to that place yep. to where you're taking those steps to get to where you want to be in your life? I I totally agree. And I mean, we are living in the craziest time ever. I mean, it must have been a shock in the sense when you went in and when you came out, like 20 years, this world, mm -hmm. like, I mean, this was I, yeah. like the technology. I had never held a cell phone. I had never been on the internet. Uh, and, you know, back in the days when I was driving, you paid for your get, like you got your gas and then you went in and paid for it. So I got out and went to the gas station for the first time. And I always give this example because it's kind of comical, but it also just it shows you that people don't even think about these types of things. I didn't know how to use a debit card. Right. So I made my mom get out of the car the first few times and it stressed me out because I felt like everybody around me knew that I didn't know. And I, I, I usually am a pretty intelligent person and I figure things out quickly and I felt stupid in those moments and I felt uh, less than, you know, I have all these little challenges. And of course, now I don't even think about those things. But the first time that I've done all these things since I have been free, yeah, I've, I've faced a lot of insecurities and challenges. Yeah, I, I just I even in just like the last five years the shift has been mind boggling. And just so you know, 48 months ago, I did not even know how to navigate Google drive. So, oh, wow. so, and I've, I've literally, I, I put my head down and did nothing, but I'm going to learn this. I'm going to conquer it. Exactly. It's 48 months. If I mean, I, I look at some of my original Canva images that I put together and <laughs> I cringe, yeah. uh, but but I mean, I, I myself was behind in, in many of those things. And part of that is age also. Right. Right yeah. now we have, we have people who are in their mid fifties and sixties that are, are getting funneled out of society. So they're, they're feeling lost. They're feeling segregated. They're feeling separated because the world and its technology has moved so rapidly and yet human beings are still working with the same caveman, caveman exactly. brain. It's like, yeah. we now have enough information and enough technology to really hurt ourselves, but we're still working within the limited brain function. We it's have. a constant battle for me and full disclosure, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm doing your podcast and I'm starting to put myself out there more and I'm like freaking out because I have social media stuff, right? But I don't do the TikTok thing, which is all the craze, right? And so nope. everybody, you need to get on TikTok. And I cringe at the thought of doing little video clips of myself every day. And then I have a website, but I haven't really done much on the website because I just am not hip to all the technology stuff. So now I'm trying to figure out, all right, how can I do updates? How can I create new content? And so it's just a constant learning process for me. Oh, I get it. I don't just, you know, I don't do TikTok yeah. because my vertical, my audience is not on TikTok. 
Right. Um, I know everybody says, oh, every platform you got to be. No, pick yeah. the ones that are the right fit, because if you try and go after all of them, you won't succeed at any of them. So I'm not I'm I'm not uh, a TikTok person. I have Instagram. I have LinkedIn and I have uh, my website. OK, that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not. Everybody goes, well, you need to be on Twitter because you're a content creator and it's like or X. And it's like, yeah, I just don't need another platform. It's I don't need another platform. Right. Yeah. So I, I I get the overwhelm there. And I can't imagine being a kid in today's world mm -hmm. trying to navigate school. Like, oh, yeah. How are the books even keeping up? How are the teachers keeping up? I don't know. And then you have AI and I feel like people are probably having, uh, you know, AI write their essays for them. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't. Well, and now they have an AI that checks AI. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, that's, that's crazy. So that's why part of the reason why I record everything all the way through and we don't go through and edit out the ums and ahs and all that mm -hmm. is that AI will not do ums and ahs. Eventually I'm sure AI will be able to mimic this entire conversation yes. in its totality, including all the uh, ums and ahs. Um, so your workbook is available online. Your mm -hmm. book is available online. Mm -hmm. Um, these are, you know, uh, part of the reason why I do these shows is so that, uh, I, I want people to live their best life in yeah. life, love and business. Who, how, how can these people help? And, and I don't necessarily subscribe to all of us, you know, spending uh, uh, $80,000 on a very high level coaching program. When I know that statistically 80% of the time people fall off, yep. which means you need to do five really great programs before you find all the pieces that come together and click together. And that is why I invite these amazing people who are making strides on local levels yeah. to come together so you can pull the pieces because they say that if you don't complete this program, you fail. The reality is this is one step closer to a better you. And I know that statistically, you know, four out of five times, you're going to stop. I've done it myself. Yeah. I bought a $3,000 coaching program to help me design a coaching course and realized I don't want to coach. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So did I fail? Or did no, I learn? Because you gained some clarity on what you want to do. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to encourage everybody. Um, if you have had any challenges, who hasn't? If you are a parent who is trying to navigate this new economic and crazy technology world mm -hmm. and you're seeing shifts in your children, um, if you've come through and you don't know where your place is in the world, mm -hmm. like there's so many reasons. Um, and, you know, investing a little bit of time uh, to, to do this for yourself is uh uh it, it doesn't it, it's just a bit of time you don't want to get down the road and wish you had spent the time so um i would like to go through your socials and where people can find you um and and i i have one question around visibility mm -hmm. and and having passed so uh i for a very long time really struggled with visibility because I was afraid mm -hmm. that somebody would say something to me. Like I don't deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. And I want to know how you are navigating this because you're right in the trenches right now. And if this is too hard of a question, you can. No. Okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I, it, I was smirking because it reminded me of an experience that I had. So, um, Shortly after my book got published, uh, my publishing company connected me to a person. And this person, I had to pay them to give me some visibility, right? They um, 
are out in LA and they have kind of a popular podcast. And so I paid this money that I didn't have. I had to borrow this money from my mom's friend. I had to swallow my pride because it meant so much to me. And I had no idea what I was doing. It was my first year out of prison. So I'm like, Hey, this will give me some exposure. Long story short, I had an interview with him, which I thought was just an introductory interview. Well, I kind of got put on the spot. It was recorded. It ended up being on YouTube and uh, I wasn't prepared. Uh, I thought that I, I was supposed to be. The deal was that I would be on the live show. Well, some people that were around this person said to him, what are you doing? Why would you put her on your show? Like that's going to look bad for you. And it was crushing for me because that was my first real dose of judgment, being free and being judged for what I did in my past. And so uh, I, I've only gone through that once. It may very well happen again, I'm sure, at some point. But you know what? It doesn't matter to me anymore because I know who I am today and I know that what I'm doing, I'm doing with pure intentions. And I'm proud of the person that I am. And I want to live my best life. You know, I want to honor people that I have hurt by being a good person. And I'm not going to feel bad about that. (laughs) I hope everybody heard that. I want to honor the people that I hurt through the past decisions by being a good person. That, that is the, the best, the biggest thing you can do. It's easy. It's easy to continue making bad decisions and blame it on somebody else. It's easy to continue in negative ways. It's really hard every day to get up and say, I'm going to do this. I have to be the best me. How do I be the best me? Yep. I really, really, really commit. I love what you just said. That is, I think that may actually be your, your quote is like, if you're not being your best, you're repeatedly dishonoring those you've harmed or, or hurt or underserved or however, if you don't show up. Exactly. So, um, okay. Plant your energy dot life is the name of your website. And then, uh, we can find you on Instagram at plat your energy and in between each word. If you're listening to this is an underscore, um, uh, you're also on LinkedIn and Cheryl dash Armstrong dash pie. Is it pie is your last name for, for plant your energy P Y E. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I thought that just meant infinite. It's infinite. Uh, well, it could. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, what is the equation of pie? <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and Cheryl folks, just so you know, if you're listening to this C H E R Y L is, and everything else is Pi is P Y E for plant your energy, but everything else is as, as in Facebook, plant your energy. Um, in closing, I always ask for some sort of closing quote, anything that helps inspire because life is hard. And I, and I am in these, you see me laughing and having fun. My life is hard. All our lives are hard. Um, but if it's not hard, it's not worthwhile. I'm sorry. These are facts. These are facts, Fode. This is only the first leg. No matter what belief you are in, if the afterlife is nothing or if the afterlife is whatever your religion or faith designs. But I do believe that this is our our, our first space. This is where we learn to be human, where we learn to have passion and compassion. So um, can you share your quote with us, Cheryl, and tell us why this is a, an important statement for you. My quote is create a vision for your life and pursue it with passion. Uh, It's important to me because this is it. This is the one life that I'm living right here. Right. And I, I want it to mean something and I want it to be filled with things that make me proud and make me happy and give me a sense of peace in my heart. And because of what I've been through in my life, I don't want that to define me. And so I've had to work extra hard. I've had to go the extra mile 
to create the kind of life that I want to have. And this is me doing it, sitting here with you right now, you know, writing the book, starting the business, doing these types of things. And it's because I will never give up. I, I always wake up each day filled with gratitude. Uh, and I was doing that when I was still in prison. It's all about having gratitude and looking for those things to keep you going, right? To keep, to not give up, just never giving up. And it is so easy to give up, folks. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to say, I'm tired, I'm done. Yeah. And you know what? I promise you, you just keep, you keep pivot, pivot, learn, shift, but be good, be good to yourself. And then in turn, be good to those around you. That's right. So anything else that you'd like to share, Cheryl, or do you think we've covered a lot here? I think we have. Yeah. I, I, there's nothing I could think of that I haven't shared already with you. <laughs> Well, folks, I appreciate your time. Cheryl and I appreciate you listening in. Um, do check out Cheryl's books. I do promise that everything, as usual, will be in the show notes. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe. Uh, if you're listening to us on Spotify, go and please, you know, give us a, a rating. You subscribe to this show on whatever platform you're at. And hey, if you know a really amazing woman out there who is making a difference, who is working diligently to live her best life and to share with others, send her my way. Send her my way. I love, I love these amazing women. Until next time, folks, all I can say is drop the shame, get in the game, and live your best life. Thank you for joining us here today at Kim Talks Resilience. I'm your host, Kim Haven, and I'd love to invite you to our resilient community at resilientgift.com. That's resilientgift.com, and we'll send you our magazine and tickets for upcoming events and all sorts of cool things we do here. So be sure to keep watching, and you know what? Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share, because we all know the share.